I want to just begin before we dive into the word together, just to express uh, I'm going to live in the basking of last night with Schubert and Debussy just for a long time, and I'm just so, so grateful for artistry and musicianship and incredible writing by Franz Schubert and Claude Debussy. Thank you so much to Anne and to Bethany and to Ben. I mean, that some of the best you'll ever get. And we have it right here. Thank you so much. Lord, as we come now to our last look in this incredible letter to the Colossian Christians, these churches gathered around Colossae in Phrygia, we pray that as we take this last bit and try to apply it, that your Holy Spirit would be our guide, our teacher, and, and you'd really allow it to speak into us just what you want. Give us ears to hear and hearts to be molded and wills that desire to be obedient unto you. In the name of Jesus, amen. Uh, just a few weeks ago, actually, there's a little park near our home, about a three-minute walk. It's where we used to take our children to play. It's a city scene, so you go to the park to get some grass. And it's called Hayburn Crescent Park, and it was a rare sunny sunshine day in Scotland. And so I went there on a Sunday afternoon, and I ended up staying about three hours just reading scripture and praying. But when I got there, there was a young mum lying on a blanket in a t-shirt and jean shorts, uh, basking in the sun and trying to get a, <laughs> it's really hard to get a suntan in Scotland. She was doing her best. And nearby was her wee little son playing. I would say he was maybe six years old. And after a few moments, he came running over with a little wee girl trailing behind him. She was maybe four to five years old. Obviously, by their interaction, a brand new friend. And as he came to his mother, he spread out his arms wide in a kind of a grand the theatrical gesture like this. And he says to his little, little friend, this is my mum. <laughs> And then that was enough. He ran around behind his mom lying there in the grass with her book and her glasses, sunglasses on. And again, a grand theatrical wide apart arms spread. And he says, this is my mom. Her name is Jacqueline. <laughs> to her new little friend. I was so struck by the generous spirit of this little guy whose name I overheard in their conversation a wee bit later, was Lucas. And his charming, his winsome manner, his obvious pride over, this is my mum. Her name is Jacqueline. This story will relate to our uh, final passage from Colossians, as we'll see in just a few moments as we conclude by considering what the Apostle Paul has to say about Christ living as it relates to the world around us. If yesterday we were examining the Apostle's notions of living a Christocentric life, living in such a way that your life is entirely centered on Jesus, then today we see Paul's concern as he comes to the end of his epistle that we understand Christ living in the world. Christ living as it relates to the world around us. And we read that, don't we, clearly in this passage, chapter 4, verses 2 to 6. So if you'll have that open with me and... Be ready to think about this with me. Christ living as it relates to the world around us. Chapter 4, verses 2 to 6. Devote yourselves to prayer, keeping alert in it with an attitude of thanksgiving. 
praying at the same time for us as well that God may open up to us a door for the word so that we may speak forth the mystery of Christ for which I have also been imprisoned in order that I may make it clear in the way I ought to speak. Conduct yourselves with wisdom toward outsiders, making the most of every opportunity. Let your speech always be with grace, seasoned, as it were, with salt, so that you may know how you should respond to each person. Perhaps, I think, the... Uh, best way to tackle this short passage is to delineate it according to what we would call its subject descriptors. There's quite a number of subject descriptors, but we're just going to highlight the main ones. The first of these is quite obvious in the text, isn't it? And we could refer to it as devoted prayer. Devote yourselves, verse 2, to prayer, keeping alert in it with an attitude of thanksgiving. Pros cartereo, devote. From the, it's the, the root of the verb, pros carterete. Devote yourselves to prayer that carries the basic sense, pros cartereo, of paying persistent attention to something. Good musicians ought to be ardent in prayer because they learn the skill of persistent attention, or you should, in the practice room all by yourself, and often that's where prayer occurs. Paying persistent attention to something, and here, of course, it is to prayer. And I don't think it should escape our notice that as we think about bringing Christ living in contact with the wide world around us, Paul should concentrate on prayer first. Devote yourselves to prayer. And that, we should approach it in the urgent and disciplined manner of proskartereo, paying persistent attention, discipline, and rigor in prayer. But what does devoted prayer, pros catareo kind of prayer, look like? Have you seen examples of that around you in your lives with people who demonstrate living this out? I can joyfully tell you that the image that comes to mind when I think of devoted prayer is Uncle Wilmus again. Like many of you have joined us in the counseling staff now, we've grown like triple. <laughs> there may be more coming. I was part of the counseling staff in the early days at Muncie. And our tradition there, our, our daily schedule was the counselors met at 10 o'clock while, while the rest of the camp, the symphony, was practicing. Others were doing all their stuff. So all the orchestra players were in rehearsal from 9 o'clock till half 11. And the counselors met at 10 o'clock, and every day for six weeks, Wilmus Chehi would come at about 11 and spend the last half hour praying with us. And I can count, remember countless times when as we prayed for students and their situations and struggles that we knew were happening back home and, and just the stress of all this going on and life issues, Wilmus would just weep as he prayed for people like you every day without fail. He had zillions of things to do as, you know, the founder and the director and the violin instructor as well. But he came and prayed half an hour. And I saw the passion in his heart. Pros cartereo, devoted to prayer. This is the history you inherit by being part of this incredible place. The second subject descriptor that we could refer to, I suggest, as open-door mission. 
open door mission that comes in verse 3, praying at the same time for us as well that God will open up to us a door for the word. The idea of an open door was widely used in the ancient world as a natural kind of metaphor for ready access to an opportunity. But here Paul is probably drawing upon his own Semitic Hebraic background in which the metaphor invokes the very particular idea of God's blessing. God opens doors to bring blessing, such as in Psalm 78 verse 23 where God, we read, opens the doors of heaven in order to pour forth his spiritual manna out on his people. Thus it is that the Apostle Paul particularly asks for prayer in which mission, so we reach out into the world around us, mission is understood to be dependent then upon God first and foremost. Dependent on God. Certainly we as agents take a critical participatory role. But as a missionary myself, I am so glad that, that all legitimate New, New Testament forms of and approaches to mission ultimately turn to God as the real initiator. I'm so glad I just join him in what he wants to do. It is not dependent on me and my skills and my brain and my passion. That comes and goes, but it's dependent on God as the initiator. He can and does and will open doors in accord with his own perfect timing, always, of course, in the interest of his own kingdom-expanding purposes. But the text, as you read it, specifies, doesn't it, that it is a mission that is focused on the Word that God will open up to us a door for the Word. That, again, as we noted yesterday, refers to, at least here in the Colossian letter, that Word of which Christ is the content, and also that Word meaning the kingdom message that Christ himself spoke and demonstrated. And in this instance, it could well be that Paul's use of tu logu, the word singularly, the word, could also refer to the very person of Jesus who is called the word, made flesh. All to say that New Testament mission is all about Christ. The content is Christ, the message is of Christ, and in fact, it is Christ, the Word made flesh. Christ is all in terms of mission as well as living. And dear young women, dear young men, this is here in the Colossian text because this is how all followers of Christ are to relate to the world around them. This is how genuine Christ living interfaces with the world around us. We are on mission together. Whether you go, as I've been called to do, or you pray, or you support, or you pursue music to the glory of Christ. We so much need, I want you to coin a new term in your head. We need missional musicians who fill up the ranks of professional music making, educators and performers both. I so disagree with that woman who spoke to Anne as she told us in her opening testimony, that arrogant missionary woman. Missionaries can be so pesky arrogant. 
She said, you remember her story? This woman came to her. I am a missionary. I have seven children. Did you ever think you could use your music for God's purposes? How ridiculous is that? She is using her music. I heard it last night like, man, I'm in heaven. <laughs> Eschatology has come. <laughs> we need you, missional musicians, missional poets, missional doctors, missional teachers, missional mothers, missional fathers who raise children. Mission is all of us together because we are convinced God so loved the world. And it's all about Christ. The Word made flesh. Open for us a door for the Word. The content is Christ. The kingdom message of Christ. Christ himself, the Word made flesh. I really want to urge you, I would love to see some of you, not all of you are going to go into music. If you do, that's great, either as teachers or performers or orchestra members or, you know, whatever it might be, choir leaders, church musicians. But not all of you will. And some of you, we need you to head into teaching English in schools. We need you to become doctors. We need you to be the best mothers who raise children for a new generation and fathers who invest in their families and do that with a missionary spirit. This is all of us. Does that make sense? Get out of this notion that, you know, a few elite people who are so arrogant and say, I'm a missionary with seven kids and maybe you can do this for the glory of God. <laughs> That really bothered me, <laughs> and, I, and rightly so. The third subject to scripture, descriptor, I would simply reference as the Christ mystery. At the end of verse 3, praying at the same time for us as well, that God may open up to us a door for the word, so that we may speak forth the mystery of Christ. The Christ mystery. This too, you will remember, yesterday or a few days ago, we made mention of it earlier in Paul. This very letter refers to it first back in chapter 1, verse 27, where in fact he fully defines the mystery in this Colossian context. This mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory, chapter 1, verse 27. And there we're talking about an experiential reality. That phrase, Christ in you, is about an experiential truth, not just a brain cognitive truth. Christ, the mystery of Jesus indwelling human beings. That is not only the essence of being his follower, but also our proclamation as to what is on offer to the world around us. Christ can take up residence in you. That being a Christ follower is not simply about professed beliefs or accord with both rational and supernatural doctrines or ethical moral codes and boundaries. It is about the wonderful and exhilarating mystery of Christ coming into your very being. And I stress this with you, brothers and sisters here at Chehi, because many of our experiences lead us to think that we're a Christian because we believe something. We're a Christ follower because it's in my head and I follow the code, and I do the right things, and I follow the boundaries. And those are important, but they are not what it's about. It's about Christ in you, the hope of glory. Christ living his life out to the world through you, through your personality, through your style, your unique demonstration of the image 
of Jesus. Paul says that we were foreknown, predestined, so as to be conformed to the image of his Son. Christ's image in you. It's a supernatural experience and reality, and so that is why Paul calls it a mystery. And the Apostle Paul reminds us that this, in fact, is the content of missionary proclamation. The experiential reality of Jesus Christ taking up residence in human beings that is the reason for total life and even societal transformation. Transformation only happens when Jesus indwells people and communities and cities even. The fourth and final subject descriptor can easily be subsumed under the heading of wise outreach. We see that clearly, don't we, in verses 5 and 6, as plain as day. Conduct yourself with wisdom toward outsiders, making the most of the opportunity. Let your speech always be with grace, seasoned as it were with salt, so that you may know how you should respond to each person. So that it is quite plain before us that wise outreach actually entails a number of descriptors itself. The first is overarching, and that, of course, is wisdom itself. Be in wisdom and sophia. If any of you know anybody named Sophie or Sophia, remind them that that's God's wisdom. <laughs> and Sophia, in wisdom, as the text there says, conduct yourselves with wisdom and Sophia toward outsider, outsiders. And just let me say something really, really important to me. Oh, how wonderful it would be if the predominance of the ways in which Christians relate to the world around them could adhere to this simple qualifier with wisdom. Or to put it another way, which apparently even Paul was too polite to say, without stupidity. <laughs> Don't be stupid. Stupid in the way you relate to outsiders. We must have wisdom. We must have do the hard work of knowing our stuff. You can't be a musician in the professional world if you haven't done your homework, haven't understood the piece, understood the composer, as our artist in residence has been forcing you. Tell me about this. Who wrote this? What time? What was the point? That's wisdom. My friend Douglas Yo, who played bass trombone in the Boston Symphony for 27 years, I think. He retired just two years ago. And he, he had a platform. Every year he gave a week-long talk at Harvard University on the arts and faith. And he brought such wisdom to the table that people listened to because he had earned the platform. Yeah? In wisdom, the other way to say it is without stupidity. <laughs> a friend of ours, Floyd and Janet, as a wonderful woman theologian, her name is Marva Dawn. She actually spoke at Chehi once or twice for whole chapel weeks. She teaches at Regent. College in Vancouver, Regents, and one of the premier theological training schools, in my opinion. She wrote a wonderful book titled This Reaching Out Without Dumbing Down. It was about worship and how worship tends to think if we dumb this down, then we'll reach people. And I see that not just in worship, but in all sorts of places. 
doesn't mean you have to be intellectual or have all sorts of degrees. It just means you do your work. You do the hard work, the study, and come prepared with wisdom. I'm finding in my work people want depth. They don't want it dumbed down. That's insulting. That's patronizing. If anything, bring it up. Raise the bar. And they'll come with you. And wisdom. And Sophia. Then Paul calls for timeliness, making the most of every opportunity. I won't take time, just because of time. <laughs> but then he adds to this gracefulness. Let your speech, so making the most of every opportunity, let your speech, verse 6, always be with grace, as it were, with salt seasoned so that you may know how you should respond to each person. It's further defined as grace that is seasoned with salt. And we know from rhetorical studies of the New Testament era that when this descriptor, seasoned with salt, is used in reference to speech, as it is here in verse 6, it might be alluding to Hellenistic preference for that which is witty and winsome. Or it may be alluding to a rabbinic ideal, again, that elevates that which is wise. But most scholars believe that Paul probably means both of those. That is Christian way of speech with the world around us, Christian rhetoric that is qualitatively witty, winsome, and wise. Witty, winsome, and wise. Winsome, you know, that kind of a quality of, of jovial truth. That quality that says, I, I want to know this person because they have a winsomeness about the truth, not pounding me over the head with truth. This, I think, is what I saw in that little boy, Lucas, who I told you about at the beginning this morning, in the right sense, he was just so proud of his mom. This is my mom. Her name is Jacqueline. <laughs> I, I just will never get that out of my head. Probably because it was sunny that day. <laughs> so proud of his mom, so rightfully proud that he so eagerly wanted to introduce his new little friend to my mum. And he did so with such a generous spirit, with such charm, childlike wit, in a manner that could only be described as winsome. And for you, young men, young ladies, and faculty, and counselors, and all of us together, let me say this. How I am determined to be part of raising up a new generation of Christians that are witty, winsome, and wise. Apologists needed. Apologists, you know that term doesn't mean you make an apology, it means you offer a convincing defense of why you believe what you believe. Apologists needed who demonstrate wit, winsomeness, and depth of wisdom. And we need those apologists with missionary vision to enter the health professions, to enter the teaching education professions, to enter medical profession and all of the healing arts to enter politics where like never before in America we need wisdom, we need wit, we need winsomeness, not stupidity. <laughs> My friends in Europe just shake their heads at what's happening, you know, and they some Americans, they are just plain stupid. <laughs> I'm sorry to tell you that. That's what they think. 
And I do too. <laughs> Think of some of you not going into music, but keeping that instrument alive and doing it to the best, but becoming a state representative or a congressman or woman or a senator for this country. And you bring wisdom. You bring winsomeness, charm, and grace, not stupidity. It would be a good thing. Lastly, I think Paul is talking about the added quality of being sensitive. I think that's what he means at the very end of verse 6, so that you may know how you should respond to each person. He's talking about being sensitive, sensitivity. The text is stressing that gift of being able to respond sensitively to people, not en masse, but according to their very individual situation and need. That's what you need to do with your friends. Who are they? What is their deed? What are the questions they're bringing? How are you relating to them, not the mass? Rick Warren said something once that really stuck with me. He said, most pastors love the crowd and hate the people. That's a danger in leadership. We want the crowd, but we don't really want to know the people or love them. Go beside them in the struggles they have. Respond to each one according to their need, to each person. And that gives me one last opportunity to tell you about my dear friend Sam Shu. My mentor, my inspiration, my brother, my compatriot in pranks and fun. And, but more than anything, somebody who just... If I could be like Sam Shu, if I could have the passion, if I could devote, uh, I, I would do it in a heartbeat. And I saw this ability to respond sensitively so clearly in this man. All the time here at Chehi, but I'll tell you about something else. I was visiting Sam when, this was not, maybe, you know, maybe 10 years before he died. Yeah, 10 years. His little apartment in downtown Philadelphia, he had this small little place, you know, and he really was a renowned man. He lived in this tiny little apartment. He had a single bed, and right beside it was a white, upright, clinky piano. And separating them were these beads that hung from the ceiling, and he called them his mantra beads. I'm going from my bed to practice <laughs> on this terrible piano. <laughs> and I'd visited him there, oh, eight or ten times, but this one was, you know, I think one of the last before he died. Um, I, I was there one other time after that, I believe. But as I went there, typically it was strewn with piano music, records, books, photos, everything you could imagine, <clears throat> but this time, books by and about the 19th century German poet and philosopher, Johann Vol Wolfgang von Goethe, the famed great Berlioz, damnation of Faust, trombone players, you got to learn that, you know, ba -ba 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 -ba. it's terrible, hard. <laughs> I, I was in an orchestra in, at Interlock, and I, I got a scholarship there, and we played that, and we had a guest conductor, and he, he didn't like the sound of that at all from the two, and I was playing first trombone, and he made, play that right now, and I did a, <laughs> he said, you should move down a seat. <laughs> I recovered, you know. <laughs> so Goethe, I'm kind of getting sidetracked. 
So he had all these books of Goethe's poetry and philosophy everywhere with yellow lined paper all over with Sam's note taking all over them. And I asked him, Sam, what's all this about? And this is what he said to me. He said, I'm building a friendship with one of the piano faculty at the Curtis Institute. A really famous guy named Gary Grafman, who, similar to Leon Fleischer, had a, a terrible situation in his right hand, became deteriorated, and he had to only do left, you know, it was only small literature for left hand piano alone. And Sam was, you know, Curtis is right there, and he was building a friendship with him, and he said, Grafman is on a Goethe kick. And I want to be able to engage with him and respond to him appropriately so that I can tell him about Christ. Isn't that amazing? I mean, he was doing all this study of Goethe just so he could respond to Gary Grafman and relate and bring Christian wisdom into Goethe's damnation of Faust. <laughs> you know, guy who makes a pact with the devil for all sorts of... It's an incredible story, you know. Well, to finish everything off in this Colossian study that we've had over these five days, you'll note one bit that I skipped over in this final passage. It's at the end of verse 3, in what is just almost just an aside, feels like kind of just an aside comment by the Apostle Paul, but it is oh so important when he writes, so that we may speak forth the mystery of Christ, for which I have been imprisoned. Some versions put it, for which I am in chains. Di hokai dedemai. It literally meant to be in chains, but it usually was an idiom for just being in prison, though some people believe Paul was both. He was actually chained up in prison because he was such a rebel rouser. For which I am in chains. I am in prison. Now, if I can ask the photographers, don't put, don't go on the screen because I'm going to tell a story really quickly about some of my Iranian friends at home. Uh, it's fine that can, I can use their name and you can record it, but they just don't want their picture seen. So, is that understood? <laughs> Many of you know that our work in Glasgow now is we have a new church. It's about a year in five, four months old called the Upper Room. It meets in our flat. It's about 60 to 70 uh, refugee asylum seekers, all Muslim background, and many of them Iranian. And these two guys gave me permission to tell you their story. The guy on the left is Mehdi, and the other guy is Farzad, and they don't mind their name being used because it's, they're both really, really common names. There could be millions of those in Iran. They're both from Iran. They both entered house churches, underground illegal house churches in uh, the city of Tehran, which is a huge city, about 16 million people. And they became part of a house church. I, I'm running a little over time, but this is really important. Is that okay? Um, and they became Christians. Mehdi's story is amazing as he found a a New Testament. No, he didn't say Bible or anything because that would be really problematic. But it was a New Testament. And reading that led him to Jesus. And then the Spirit led him to an underground illegal house church. And Farzad became part of a house church with his wife and two children. And I tell all of that because both of them went to prison. Mehdi for eight months Farzad for a year and a half in which they both ex experienced really horrendous kind of torture. 
I asked Mehdi, are you sure I can tell this? He said, yes. I want them to know the situation and pray. Mehdi, uh, he's kind of a good-looking chap. He was homosexually raped just time after time after time as a form of torture. Farzad, when I met him, he I was on a crutch, and he's still on a crutch because they had taken a rifle butt and just smashed his right foot over and over. It was, it was a use, it was horrendous looking foot. For which I am in chains. This gospel, this Christ is all lifestyle reflects the cost of discipleship. Paul, just as an aside, for which I am in prison. The cost of discipleship, the cost of open door mission, the cost involved in what it means when Christ is all, what it means when Christ is preeminent in your life. So we're going to conclude this morning and this week with what I'd like you to do and enter with me in my part of the world in Scotland. The Celtic history is so strong. Celtic Christians from uh, the 4th century and the 5th century, St. Columba and St. Patrick, they had something in the Celtic spiritual tradition that was called, it's time for silence for soul work. And I'm going to ask you to enter with me a silence for soul work. Paul, you know, eventually was executed. He was in prison, released and brought back and then executed. And this reflects if you're going to live the Christ-centered life, if you choose that Jesus really is preeminent, that Jesus is all to you, there's a cost. We say to our Muslim background asylum seekers and refugees who are considering the Jesus way, we are so bold with them, we put it this way. Following Jesus Christ won't cost you a little. Following Jesus Christ won't cost you a lot. Following Jesus Christ will cost you everything. even your life, potentially. And so just now, would you just become silent, and I'll ask you to do the Celtic silence of soul work. And ask the Spirit of Jesus to speak to you. Living a life in which Christ is preeminent requires the highest bar of discipleship that costs not a little, not a lot, everything. Are you willing to pay it? Will you pay the cost? Let's just be silent for a moment. Lord God, I thank you for Mehdi and Farzad who have taught me so much about the cost of making Christ first. 
bless them, encourage them, keep them safe. Thank you that they're in Scotland now and building a new life. And the incredible power of the gospel to change people because it is about Christ in you, the hope of glory. Devote yourselves to prayer, keeping alert in it with an attitude of thanksgiving. Praying at the same time for us as well that God may open up to us a door for the word so that we may speak forth the mystery of Christ, for which I also am in chains, in order that I may make it clear in the way I ought to speak. Conduct yourselves with wisdom toward outsiders, making the most of every opportunity. Let your speech always be with grace, seasoned as it were with salt, so that you may know how you should respond to each person. Amen. <laughs>